You're listening to Making Waves, Fresh Ideas in Freshwater Science. Making Waves is a bi-monthly podcast where we discuss new ideas in freshwater science and why they matter to you. Making Waves is brought to you with support by the Society for Freshwater Science, Arizona State University's School of Life Sciences, and the University of Washington School of Aquatic and Fishery Sciences. This is Eric Moody with the Making Waves podcast. I'm joined this month by Dr. Sapna Sharma, who is an associate professor at York University in Canada. Thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me on your program. So a lot of your research has focused on climate change and how it's affecting lakes. And in particular, we've done some really interesting work lately on ice cover in lakes and how the duration of ice cover is changing. So before we get into that kind of research, I wanted to just start by asking you if you could talk a little bit about what happens with some of these lakes in colder areas that freeze over, because I know a lot of people that I talk to now that I live in Arizona don't really know much about lakes freezing over. It's sort of an unusual phenomenon. So could you just talk a little bit about how lakes freeze over and why this is important? Sure. So where I'm from in Toronto, we actually, lakes not freezing over is a weird occurrence. So it's kind of a nice contrast from where you are and where I am. So basically what happens in the winter when temperatures dip below freezing for a while, the lake freezes. And so as a limnologist, what we're interested in and particularly in with respect to climate science, is the date that the lake freezes in the winter and then the date that the ice melts off the lake in the spring. The reason we're interested in that is because it can sort of give us an idea of climate change. And winter ice cover is important for in many aspects, ecologically, but also culturally. So culturally, it's important and socioeconomically in terms of ice fishing, skating, and recreational activities. For example, living in Canada, we sort of think of winter as being cold. Um, (laughs) And there being ice on, on lakes and snow on the ground. Ecologically, it seems as if winter ice cover may be a major force in determining characteristics of summer lake warming trends. And so this is a recent publication that we conducted with a global lake temperature collaboration. And we found that the presence of ice cover was actually one of the most important factors on identifying how fast a lake warms. And ice covered lakes warm twice as fast as non ice covered lakes. But they're also important in determining productivity. So how productive is a lake? How does that influence nutrient cycling and chlorophyll levels and fish behavior, for example, under the ice in the winter. What are some sources of variation in the duration of ice cover among years? So there are three major things that we look for when we look at variation and duration of the timing of ice seasonality. First is weather, so local weather. Things simple as air temperature, so it's cold enough, precipitation, cloud cover, snow, wind events, and solar radiation can all be correlated to ice breakup through their influences with climate and lake ice. The second major driver that we've found, and many other studies have found too, that are correlated to lake ice is large-scale climate drivers. These include El Nino Southern Oscillation Indices, the North Atlantic Oscillation, solar sunspots, and the quasi biennial Oscillation, and all these large-scale climate drivers have been attributed to lake ice breakup in the spring, and that's because of their large-scale influence on climate. And the third thing we've found, so once we account for local weather and these oscillations through large-scale climate drivers, we found in many lakes that there tends to be the linear trend in the data that we're attributing to climate change. You've argued that the timing and duration of ice cover is particularly sensitive to climate change. Is that because of these complex effects of various climatic cycles, or are there other factors causing that? That's exactly right. So it's like the complex relationship between these large-scale climate drivers, but also the local climate and local weather sort of interacting together to influence lake ice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if 
something changes in somewhere along the way, there could be a lot of complex interactions. It seems that way. Yeah. So you've done some really interesting work looking at long-term trends in ice cover, and one of the things that's particularly impressed me is some of these data sets that you work with that date back over 500 years. So could you talk a little bit about what these data sets are and how you found them? Sure. So the data sets that you're referring to, there's two in particular. So there's one from Japan, a lake in Japan called Lake Sua, and its record extends back to 1442. And, and I'll talk a little bit about how the data was collected. And the second is the Torn River in Scandinavia and Finland, and that data set goes back to 1693. And my collaborator, Dr. John Magnuson from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, actually came across these data Data sets. He was hosting a workshop in the 1990s on lake and river ice, and he invited collaborators from around the world, and his request was, can you bring data sets from your country to our meeting? It was held in Trout Lake in Wisconsin. So to his great surprise, a colleague from Japan brought this over 550-year record, and then a colleague from Finland brought this over a 300-year record to this meeting. From then, they've made this data public through the National Snow and Ice Data Center, and then we can start analyzing it further. But the stories about how these data sets were started being collected is really interesting to me. For Lake Sua, so this lake is in the Japanese Alps, and there's a shrine that's located on the lake. The shrine belongs to Shinto priests and Shinto monks, and they were really interested in knowing the date that the lake froze because there was this ridge called the Amawatari that was formed on the ice. The reason they were interested was because their legend, the Shinto legend, said that on this lake there once was a god and goddess that lived together in a shrine, but they got into a disagreement and the goddess moved out, moved to the other side of the lake and built herself her own shrine. But then every winter when the lake froze, the god would cross with his dragon and visit the goddess to ask for forgiveness. And the Shinto priests would celebrate this event because the god left the Amawatari, the ridge, behind when he crossed the lake. And so they would have a purification ceremony that would last several days and they'd celebrate this event and use it to forecast harvest, rice harvest. They found actually, interestingly, the years when the lake did not freeze and the Amawatari was not present, they had very poor rice harvest and those seem to have been correlated with some of the major famines wow. through Japanese history. But they kept all these records and they kept them on rice paper and John Mangston went to Japan in the 2000s and he met with the priest and gathered all this data through the rice paper records and even now we work with translators who communicate with the current Shinto priest to get even the latest data mm -hmm. uh, which is really cool yeah. whereas the Torn River data set it was started by Finnish merchants there was a guy who was just interested in knowing when the river ice would melt because it was such a spectacular sight. And he would record each year when it would melt. And there were actually like seven years missing in his record. And that was because he had to leave Finland to escape the Russians that were invading. Uh -huh. And then he came back and he kept maintaining the record. And then other people started being records. And this town where the they were maintaining the record it turned out that they had a newspaper in this town and that helped because then you could keep track in the newspapers when the spectacular event of the river melting happened and now they have these ice breakup guessing competitions where they will guess up to the second when the river melts and the the finish kept really meticulous records of all the different people who recorded the river ice breakup and so you can go back and those records are available and actually see all the the written documentation of when the river melted which is which is pretty cool because that gives you a sense of climate but also it gives you a sense of human history because you know all these these lake and ice uh, river records go back through centuries. Right. It's amazing to me 
not just that people started recording this information so long ago, but that it survived for such a long amount of time, too. They started the records and they maintained them through, like the Shinto records been maintained through 15 generations of priests being there. And there's some dates in the middle of the Japanese record that are missing. They still recorded whether the lake froze or not and whether there was an Awatari present, but they didn't record the date that it happened. And I think there might have been some sort of ruling from the emperor who didn't want this information recorded. Mm -hmm. And so there was a time where they didn't keep as meticulous notes for the Japanese record, but it was still kind of interesting. Another problem we ran into with these data sets was the problem with a calendar change, which I would have never predicted. So the calendar changed from a lunar calendar to a Gregorian calendar. Hmm. And in Scandinavia, they dealt with it pretty systematically. It wasn't straightforward, their rubric of figuring out converting the dates between the two calendars, but it was systematic and it was the same throughout the country. Whereas in Japan, it wasn't clear. So each shrine changed their calendar on their own schedule and they didn't have to follow systematic rules. And so that kind of made it difficult for us when the calendar date changed to actually be sure about in the Shinto shrine, when they switched from lunar to Gregorian, and what rules they used to make the switch. That was a very unexpected problem <laughs> that we encountered. And so we needed to, you know, talk to climate scientists, but also we needed to talk to people who spoke the native language. So we ended up having really different challenges than you might experience working with current ecological data. Yeah, I've heard a lot of stories about problems people have with their data, but that's a new one for me. <laughs> yeah. yeah, definitely. With these incredible records, what kind of things have you found? Have you found any long-term trends in ice cover that could be related to climate change? Yeah, so we found several major things. First, we found that climate is warming more rapidly than the Industrial Revolution. And this is something that many people have shown using all sorts of records and something that we as scientists all are pretty comfortable with knowing. But the reason that it was important to show with these ice records is that these are one of the few climate data sets that have been collected directly by humans. So actual human observations of long-term data extending before the Industrial Revolution are extremely rare. And there are some people who don't want to rely on paleo records or modeling inferences. And so they question whether climate is actually happening or is it sort of a, an inference from the techniques that we are using to infer climate change. And so this was a direct human observations collected by people who had no knowledge or interest in climate change. So I think that was one of our our main points for the dissemination of our work for climate science in general. The other thing that we found was that in the last 50 to 65 years, climate events are becoming more extreme. So the example we used for Lake Sua was whether or not the lake froze or not. So in the first 250 years of the data set, the lake did not freeze three times, whereas in the last 50 years, the lake did not freeze 12 times. In the last 10 years, it didn't freeze five times. And so something as simple as does a lake freeze or not can give you an indication of climate warming. And we did account for population and geysers and hot springs in the lake. And still, regardless of all the sort of extra land use type and anthropogenic influences, we found that the climate signal was really directly related to these more extreme events. Third major thing that we found that I was particularly interested in was looking at how large-scale climate drivers have changed. So as I mentioned, this record extends before the Industrial Revolution. So what we could do was compare what the frequencies of these large-scale climate drivers was like before the Industrial Revolution and after. What we found was that before we had evidence of a lot of 
short-term oscillations and long-term multi-decadal oscillations. So things like, for example, the Enso El Nino Southern Oscillation or North Atlantic Oscillation extended in multi-decadal periods. And we have a lot of evidence for that. Whereas since the Industrial Revolution and particularly in the last half century, all those large-scale long-term oscillations seem to be missing from both time series. That I found particularly interesting because it seems to suggest there might be a structural change in these large-scale climate drivers. It could make sense because, for example, ENSO is a measurement of sea surface temperatures between two regions, but you sort of think of them as being constant, and the fact that those are changing may then have fundamental consequences on many aspects of our climate. And so I think that's a, an area that would be great for climate scientists to explore. On. So let's get back to some of these issues you mentioned about working with the long-term data. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you do a lot of work with different types of very large data sets. Do you yep. see particular challenges to, to doing work with these kind of large data sets? So like you said, I work with different kinds of large data sets. So these were different than what I normally work on as these extend really far back in time. And so they had their own challenges. Other studies that I work on, we have a lot of spatial coverage and those present a lot of challenges as well because I think the biggest challenge is quality control. So keeping track of all the data, where they're coming from and what sorts of factors may have been at play in a particular year or in a particular site. That can be challenging when you're working and synthesizing such large data sets, but I also find that really interesting because you can learn a lot about a place or the people who kept the records or took measurement from these like synthetic records. I hear a lot about how we're entering this age of big data and Mm -hmm. that more people are doing research with large data sets like this. Do you think that we'll be able to come up with a streamlined process or is this going to always be a challenge? I think that's a good question. So the big data world is sort of being kind of streamlined into programming everything. And so, you know, you write some code and you have so much data and the idea is that this code will pick up on some errors. But so there are a couple old school people on these teams and we really value looking at the data. Mm -hmm. So even if you're programming and coding, you miss a ton of things because there might just be a particular site that's not right or the depth isn't the same or, you know, there could be any number of things. For example, a calendar change and you might not know about that. Right. And so... Even in the age of big data, I think it's really important to look at your Excel sheets and plotting your data, just getting a sense of what is actually in there. Because when you start working in this big data realm and processing a ton of data, it can be easier to, to miss things. Well, uh, thanks a lot for joining me then. Oh, thank you for your interest in our work. You've been listening to the Making Waves podcast. Brought to you with support by the Society for Freshwater Science. For more information on this speaker, the Making Waves podcast, or the Society in general, please visit us on the web at the Society for Freshwater Science webpage. Tune in next time for another fresh idea in freshwater science.